we're one more year ahead. But today, as we press forward, we're also looking back at 2018 to review the accomplishments of the Ministry of Finance and Public Service. Hi, I'm Theodore Henry. On the pages of Jamaica Magazine today, we're also sharing with you some natural and material beauties of our island home. All that and so much more planned just for you. Do stay with us. Reggae music has been added to the UNESCO's list of international cultural treasures worthy of protection and promotion. Jamaica became the first Caribbean country to ever qualify for a senior FIFA Women's World Cup. And we want to boost the participation of fathers in the household. Just a taste of what awaits you in the full review of the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport for the year 2018. Good day, I'm Stephen McHugh and this is your GIS News for Wednesday, January 9. The government intends to spend an additional $11.45 billion for the 2018-2019 fiscal year, which ends on March 31. Spending is proposed to be increased from $791.11 to $802.56 billion. The figure was revealed in the second supplementary estimates tabled by Minister of Finance and the Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark, at Tuesday's sitting of the lower house. Members of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee are to deliberate on the estimates on January 10, after which it will go before the lower house on January 15. Recurrent or housekeeping expenses have moved from $572.46 billion to $582.5 billion. Development or capital spending will move by $1.36 billion from $218.64 to $220 billion. Road maintenance and structures will account for the lion's share of the increase. The funds will go towards drain cleaning, road patching and repairs, as well as other road-related works associated with rain events. Public bodies such as the Jamaica Urban Transit Company Limited and the Montego Bay Metro Company Limited received money to meet operating expenses. The National Health Fund has been allocated a billion dollars for reduction in receivables owed by the Ministry of Health. The National Water Commission has been provided $710.6 million to settle amounts owed by ministries, departments and agencies of government, while the Spectrum Management Authority is seeking $325 million for repayment from the sale of license. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says the state will continue to use all the resources at its disposal to drive down crime even as the states of public emergency SOPEs in several sections of the island have lapsed. The House of Representatives on December 11 voted not to extend the SOPEs in St. Catherine North, St. James and specified areas in Kingston. Giving an update in Parliament Tuesday, Prime Minister Andrew Holness said the SOPEs and the zones of special operations had resulted in 21.9% less murders and 22.3% less shootings in 2018 than in 2017. Mr. Holness said the enhanced security measures could also be credited for the 20 murders recorded as at January 7, when compared to 45 in the previous year. Mr. Holness said 20 murders were recorded as of January 7 when compared to 45 in the previous year. In St. Catherine North, murders decreased by 28.5% and shootings by 40.9% in 2018 when compared to 2017. Similar results were achieved in St. James with murders declining by 70% and shootings by 58.6% in comparison to 2017. Mr. Speaker, with the resources at our disposal, we will continue to focus on containing the gangs, maintaining presence as best as possible in order to reassure the public using all the powers available under the JCF Act to ensure the maximum level of security possible for our citizens. We have been doing so by using curfews and cordons and other methods at our disposal. Mr. Holness said enhancing the capacity of the criminal justice and law enforcement systems would also be prioritized. The government is well advanced in executing Plan Secure Jamaica, which will see the reduction of murders to below the regional average of 16 per 100,000, which would mean 
having a total number of murders under 500. And we are committed to having this within the next decade. This will take time. And the development of the unity of purpose within the parliament and the whole of government and the entire country around crime management strategies and methods. I'm committed, Mr. Speaker, to ensuring that there is national unity. In the meantime, the government and parliamentary opposition will on January 16 hold talks with stakeholder groups to advance national consensus on crime. The meeting with private sector, the churches, human rights and civil society groups follows Monday's discussions between Prime Minister Andrew Holness and opposition leader Dr. Peter Phillips and their respective teams. Those talks centered on issues of national security and crime management, as well as the desire to have a national consensus on the matters. Issues discussed included human rights, possible legislative amendments to enhance crime management, financial, technical and human resources to improve the capacity of the security forces. Government and opposition legal teams will also meet to discuss and agree, where possible, on the crime control powers to be utilized in the existing legislative framework or new legislation. In an effort to safeguard Jamaica's energy security, the state will be using legislative action to retake ownership of the 49% shares in Petrojam. The shares are held by the Venezuelan state-owned oil and natural gas company PDV Caribe. At a press conference Tuesday, Foreign Affairs Minister Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith said relevant legislation would be taken to Parliament to facilitate the reacquisition of the shares. What is therefore proposed is a new bill, a new law, which specifically addresses the purchase of this, or rather ownership of the 49% shareholding in Petrojam. It will not be a general piece of legislation which allows for uh, acquisition of property rights other than land beyond the scope of the specific purchase or transfer of ownership of the 49% shares in Petrojam, currently held by PDV Caribe. Petrojam shares were sold in August 2006 and February 2007. The agreement included the upgrade and expansion of the country's oil refinery. This was to improve its competitiveness as well as to meet local and international market demands. However, Minister Johnson-Smith says these specific objectives have not been met despite Jamaica's attempts at trying to resolve the matter. She says dialogue included a high-level government meeting between Jamaica and Venezuela and a commitment given by the South American country to facilitate the upgrades within three months and financial provisions made by Jamaica. Our decisions regarding our efforts to ensure the viability of Petrojam have not been and are not political. They are purely economic. But it has become clear that the previously shared interest in and prioritization of Jamaica's energy security, which drove PCJ and PDV Caribe to agree to operate and upgrade Petrojam together, no longer exists. And finally, International security expert Dr. Peter Tarlow has assessed the country's tourism sector as being transparent with respect to producing a safe and secure destination for visitors. Dr. Tarlow, whose experience in security management includes working with governments in Brazil, the United States of America and Mexico, is currently on the island at the request of the tourism ministry. In recent months, Destination Jamaica has come under scrutiny by the international media with reports of sexual assaults by tourism workers against visitors. Dr. Tarlow says in his estimation, there is no cover-up with regards to safety breaches. What really impresses me about Jamaica in this very, this very short period of time is the desire to cooperate and to collaborate between various sectors of the industry. People have been incredibly open I would say this is one of the most transparent countries I've been in, and I'm in a different country every week. The noted security expert was speaking yesterday at a press conference called by Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett to provide an update on the tourism security audit. The review is being conducted on 16 tourism properties across the country to develop a safety and security manual for the industry. It is expected to be completed by June 2019. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Stephen McHugh. Thanks for watching.
no new taxes. Sound familiar? That was one of the impactful moments coming out of the Ministry of Finance and Public Service last year. Let's revisit the many other accomplishments. Ministers change, the state minister was promoted, but the financial report for 2018 shows no traction lost in the calculated pursuit of growth and fiscal discipline. We remain disciplined in our debt reduction strategy. There has been tax revenue buoyancy. And it's a game changer for innovation, for opportunity, and for growth. Over the last 12 months, the Finance Ministry secured funding from its multilateral partners and made space in the national budget to support the drivers of economic growth. It will support more than 1,000 partial credit guarantees to enable the financial sector to provide more loans to small and medium enterprises through the Improved Credit Enhancement Facility. No revenue measures for fiscal year 2018-19 Read my lips, no new taxes. The tax break did not slow down revenue collections. The money is to help finance the $791 billion national budget for the 2018-2019 fiscal year. Early in the calendar year, the Ministry's investment in the upgrading of the Queen's Warehouse led to a reopened facility with increased storage capacity able to maximize revenue. And then this. When we move the limit from 0 to 5%, based on the $550 billion in pension funds, over $25 billion of capital will be available for investing in venture capital. The state's liabilities were managed with care in 2018. Our debt reduction strategy has been anchored around a primary surplus target of 60% debt to GDP by 25, 20, the financial year 2025-26. The projected goal is in sight as the debt to GDP ratio dropped below 110% in the year. Government also had no need to dip into the IMF's precautionary standby funds and Cabinet in fact approved the establishment of an independent fiscal council to monitor the economic reform gains post-agreement. So that our exit from a program relationship with the IMF is sustained over time with no need to return. I now move to introduce and have read a first time a bill shortly entitled the Bank of Jamaica Amendment Act 2018. The bill seeks to improve the governance of the central bank. Mr. Speaker, Jamaica remains committed to honoring obligations under CARICOM to which we are signatories. Accordingly, the Customs Tariff Revision Amendment Resolution 2018 is hereby submitted to this Honorable House for confirmation. Matter approved. I'm pleased to announce that the cabinet at its last meeting has approved the development of a national natural disaster risk financing policy. The new country program, which is applicable for the period 2018 to 2023, will focus on water and environment management, health and nutrition, food and agriculture, nuclear and radiation safety and security, and energy and industry. The Ministry recognized the value in the collective skills and knowledge of the public sector workforce and deployed its negotiating skills to secure four-year wage deals with more workers in 2018.
we are uh, particularly pleased that we are now at 91% of the, the public sector you know, covered by uh, agreements that cover four years to 2021. On the flip side, work under the public sector transformation program continued with the implementation of the special early retirement program, SERP. We are very pleased with the continued direction of the positive trends in the economy and the prospects that they hold for job creation. Generally, uh, there is a sense of confidence in the economy. So much so, international rating agencies Standard & Poor's and Moody's both improved their outlook for Jamaica from stable to positive. The country was also rated B by Fitch with a positive outlook in January. It really stresses how far Jamaica has come on reducing its debt and improving the macroeconomic outlook. Um, I think the future is bright. We have been able to in two short years to almost double capital expenditure. That is only possible because we have so far been successful in the implementation of our economic reform program. It promises to improve our lives, to improve your life and we are just getting started. Jamaica Eye is part of an island-wide network of camera surveillance systems designed to increase the safety of you, our citizens. If you have a camera system outside your home or office facing a public space, join us in helping to make Jamaica a safer place for all. Log on to jamaicaeye.gov.jm today. Jamaica Eye, we're all connected. The Ministry of National Security, creating a safer and prosperous Jamaica. It's a new year with new possibilities, and it would be nice to explore some more of Jamaica. Well, here are some interesting places in St. Thomas that you can put on your list of places to visit this year. one of the oldest parishes in the island that might have been originally named after Thomas Hickman Lord Windsor, the then governor of Jamaica in 1662. Seated in a right angle, bordered by the spellbinding St. Andrew on the west, the picturesque Portland on the north, and then gently washed by the waves of the Seine Caribbean Sea. Bienvenido a St. Thomas. Welcome to St. Thomas. Full we play, St. Thomas. We're there. St. Thomas Adena, welcome to St. Thomas. However you put it, we're there St. Thomas. Join us on this travelogue. We'll be moving throughout the creases and corners of this beauty, turning the pages of our local history book in which you will see the Old Burden Wharf, Judgment Cliff, Roselle Waterfall, and other places. The cliff high above the Landaway community in St. Thomas at first glimpse appears to be just like any other overlook in the parish. But take a second look and you'll notice that a section of it is completely gone. Known as Judgment Cliff, it got its name from a story of how an entire community was wiped out during the 1692 earthquake. It's a story that passed through generations in the community 
and one that residents readily recount to passerbys like myself. Judgment Cliff, I was informed that they used to have a plantation up there run by a serious, wicked and slave master. Imposed jacconian measures on the farmers and one of the reasons why they, they resided on the cliff that in, in, in case the slave wanted to run away, they would have difficulty in doing so. The place collapsed. I guess during the same time, Port Royal earthquake was taking place. That was 1692. It was a plantation to people who really lived there too. Everybody get covered out. Then say, when it happens, it's at night. It's the, they say, a man, a rooster, and a bull seal. The man gone out down wild. The rooster fly off of the roost. The bull broke down the pen, gone out. Gone wild, same like the man. We're still set on traveling this allure, blessed indeed by the events of history. Right now, we're headed to a gem up the road on the corner. Tumbling over the rocks onto the roadside is an area known for its pristine waterfalls and fishes. The Rizal waterfall is used for bathing and even for washing by residents or those passing by. It was once a busy area for commerce and entertainment prior to Hurricane Dean in 2007. But despite that, residents still enjoy the untouched water and how it seemingly removes all pains and ills. And from that water that falls, our next stop is a spot where the residents fish. This fishing area named Lethal Beach, right? When the weather good, we go to sea and fish. When it's bad, we have to stay on the land. Well, we've been doing this about some, some 50 years now, and as we do it for a living. So I maintain the family. We have to prepare the net, we buy the net, we ready make, and we put on the fittings towards it. We put on the lead and the cork and so on. Like when you see it here, you know, we put it in the boat and go out and fish. We catch all type of fish. We catch snapper, we catch parrot, grunt, barracuda, doctor fish, all type of different, different fishes. Sometimes tourists pass and they take pitch down all them kind of thing. And you, them like when they're knitting in it, sometimes they spend all the day with it. This is my daily living and that's something I enjoy all my life. I don't know how it's work but fishing now. Back in the days, over Bournemouth, they usually do a lot of, export a lot of things over there. You know? We even use our small canoe and go over there to fish through the day. It's just across, across from the other side of the fishing village. St. Thomas is a major growing area for food such as banana, coffee, coconut, sugarcane, and even for fishing. It houses one of the island's natural deep water harbors that was once used as a port for exporting these same food items. Now, we couldn't come to St. Thomas and not mention anything about our national hero Paul Bogle or the popular Marant Bay Rebellion. Yeah, the Marant Bay Rebellion took place at the Marant Bay Courthouse with Paul Bogle and his followers marching from Stony Gut to Martin Bay. Poverty and inequality in the society forced Paul Boga to lead the protest march to this courthouse on October 11, 1865. In a violent confrontation with official forces, nearly 500 people were killed and more were flogged and punished before order was finally restored. On October 24, 1865, Paul Bogle was arrested and executed at this very same spot of land, the Morant Bay Courthouse. And just like that, we've ended our tour in this natural and material beauty, unfolding the stories behind just a few places. If you haven't been here already, then what are you waiting for?
coffee was introduced to Jamaica in 1728. Creighton Estate was established around 1765 and the Blue Mountain Range and the central region of Jamaica, which is the Grand Ridge of Jamaica, was the major coffee producing regions. Currently, we are fully certified under the Rainforest Alliance and we are the very first entity in the Caribbean region to attain that certification. Now, the Blue Mountain Range of Jamaica is a microclimate of the island and has provided the perfect conditions for growing the Arabica coffee. A typical day in the Blue Mountain, the most sunlight is in the mornings from about 11.32 to 4 p.m. You know, this is the weather that we experience. This is a norm in the Blue Mountain. It's nothing unusual, you know, for the range to be covered with mist. And after sunset, the temperature basically goes below 20 degrees Celsius. So those are the perfect ingredients to develop high quality coffee. You know, the culture here is rich. We're an extremely creative, you know, set of people. In Jamaica, there's everything. If you're a nature lover, we have it. If you like the wetlands, we have it. You know, great coffee, you know, great food. You know, God has been good to us. <laughs> you know, the God has been good to us. The universe has been good to us, you know, as a country. You know, and, uh, this rock, I love it, man. <laughs> I love it. <laughs>